Well, I want to give you a very warm welcome. Uh, it's good to have you joining with us this evening. And just to reiterate some of those announcements uh, there from this morning. Uh, don't forget about the Holiday Bible Club flowers. These are out now, so feel free if you want to take some. The only thing we would ask, if you are going to take some, distribute them round the street where you are. Please let us know where that is and where you're doing that. Uh, just so whenever we do door to door, so we don't end up doubling up over the same area. And as I say, people can actually return these, uh, the little form at the back, or there's also an online form where you can basically tell people to go onto the Facebook page and they can get it from that. Uh, but don't use the little QR code. There has been a little bit of an issue with that one. If you don't know what a QR code is, then that's fine. Don't worry about it. All right. <laughs> but there's plenty of those at the back. We do have uh, lots of them if you want to uh, take some and give them out. And then over the coming days, we'll hope to maybe do some uh, door-to-door with those again, maybe even God willing next week um, as well. So that's the 7th to the 11th of August. And do keep that in your prayers because a lot of arrangements are being made for that at the minute as well too. We're going to sing together as we begin. We'll stay seated as we sing the the first hymn. This is one we've sung a little while ago, actually. Uh, There is one gospel in which I stand for all eternity. We'll We'll stay seated as we sing this, please.
Well, what tremendous words are that hymn. We stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Beautiful words. And let's respond even to the Lord, even with thanksgiving and prayer. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks, Lord, even for the message of the gospel which we have believed, which we have taken hold of, a message which has has transformed our life. Father, we want to thank you, Lord, that you, being rich in mercy because of even the great love with which you loved us, Lord, that when we were dead in trespasses and sins, you made us alive together with Christ. Lord, we know it's by grace that we have been saved, not through any merit of our own, but through our Father, all because of your grace and through what Christ has done. Father, you've raised us up, Lord, even from the Mary pit, Lord, from the pit of sin, from the way of darkness into the way of light. And Father, we know and we are assured in the promises of your word, Lord, we know that our Savior is risen, And we know that because of his resurrection life, one day we too will experience this as well. And Father, it is immeasurable riches of your grace, your great kindness which you've shown towards us in Christ, that we have been saved by grace through faith. Lord, it's not of our own doing, it's through your precious gift. And Father, we delight in the message of the gospel. We delight to proclaim it. And Father, even tonight as we look at one who is willing to put his life on the line for the gospel, Father, may it challenge us even about our response to that message too. Father, in this world that we are living in with its many different pressures even the society puts upon us, Father, help us to remain true to the truth. Help us to cling to your word. Father, as we continue to walk with you, Lord, May we grow deeper even in our understanding of the gospel. And may it impact us daily, Lord. May we preach the gospel to ourselves daily. And Lord, may we respond rightly to you, offering our lives and living service to you. Help us, Lord, even in our time together this evening. Help us to glorify your name. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing another hymn together. And if the the, the last one there was a more modern hymn about the gospel, this is a a, a very well-known, old traditional hymn about the gospel, but one we delight to proclaim, the old rugged cross. And let's stand with you as we sing this together, please.
stained with blood and so divine. A wondrous beauty I see. For twas on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So watch it. Well, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Acts once again, um, Acts chapter 6, Acts chapter 6. And as we've moved through the book of Acts, we've seen that the power of the gospel having uh, a great impact, not just in the lives of those in Jerusalem, but it's been spreading abroad. It's beginning to go now outside of Jerusalem. And that, of course, we know that's only the beginning. But also as the gospel has been spreading, we've seen the increase of the pressure being put upon the church. There's been two instances so far where the apostles have been arrested. In the first instance, the apostles were let go with a warning and told not to speak in the name of Jesus. Yet they said, we must obey God rather than men. And so this led to the second arrest where they were then beaten. We saw also that when Satan couldn't hinder the church from outside, he then sought to do so from within. Uh, First with the sin of Ananias and Sapphira. And then the second with the potential problem that we looked at last week. Were that emerged between Jewish speaking believers and those who spoke Greek. Uh, Some of the the Greek widows are being neglected. The Greek speaking widows. And yet we saw last week how that was dealt with successfully. And how the church prospered. And they chose seven men to to serve the widows in need. And tonight we're going to look at what happened next. What happened actually to one of those seven? And here we see how pressure is beginning to intensify for the early church. We're going to read together and then we'll sing together once more. So we're reading from verse 8 till the end of uh, chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 8 of Acts. And it says, uh, And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and of those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they they, they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him, and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. And we'll end our reading there at the very end of chapter Uh, 
Before we turn to God's word once again, let's sing another hymn together. We'll just stay seated as we sing this. It's purify my heart. Let me be as gold. Let's sing this together. Just stay seated. Let's pray together once again before we turn to God's word. Heavenly Father, may that be our prayer, Lord, that as we read your word, as we study it together, that you would use it to purify our hearts, Lord, that you would challenge us even by your word, that through it, Lord, you, you would do that shaping, Lord, even in our lives. And sometimes, Lord, you, you do even use even difficult times, times of suffering, trials in our life to even shape us and father help us to yield to your will to be ready to do your will father we want to give you thanks lord even for your great sovereignty your great wisdom lord you do know all things and father even as we come to a passage tonight where maybe many believers in the church may have struggled with what was happening but yet father you ultimately had a purpose on it And so, Lord, help us to see that this evening. Speak to us now through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So please turn to Acts chapter 6 once again, please. You know, I wonder who you resemble. Whenever a child is born, 
And as they grow, people love to remark on who they most resemble, which parent they resemble more. Whether it might be their, their physical features, or maybe in some cases it's a, a character trait or even mannerisms. People are often quick to point out similarities, aren't there, in their children with their, their parents. But what's going on in this passage, we're about to meet a man who actually closely resembles another. He closely resembles his master. Luke introduces us to a man called Stephen. He was one of the seven who'd been set aside to minister to the widows in need. But yet we see here in these verses that this wasn't the only area of ministry that they engaged in. Uh, And I explained that last week. Uh, We first met Stephen back in verse 5. And Luke tells us he was a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. He says that straight after speaking of Stephen, indicating to us that he's going to have more to say about him shortly. And we'll see tonight he does. But now he adds that Stephen was one who was full of grace and power. And here we see, actually, Stephen is one who, in many ways, does resemble Christ, his master, even in some of the things he went through. But is not a responsibility of all of us. Here we see tonight, first of all, actually, in many ways, in this passage in verse 8, we see even the resemblance in his ministry as well. He, Jesus, of course, he was proclaiming the message of the kingdom. He did miracles as well. And here we see Stephen began to do some signs and wonders uh, as well too. He was one who was full of the Spirit, we're told here. A man full of the Holy Spirit. And, of course, Jesus too was full of the Spirit and of wisdom. But, of course, Jesus was much more as well than, than just wise. He was the very power and wisdom of God. He was the Word made flesh. He revealed God's truth to this world. Jesus revealed that truth. The truth about the state of man and the state of man's heart. And the state of uh, also the truth of God and how we can be reconciled to him. And as one who followed the teaching of Jesus passed down through the apostles... Stephen sought to resemble his master. He also was full of the Holy Spirit. He displayed even that power of the the Spirit, even in these signs and wonders. Now, and up to this point in, in Acts, we've been reminded only how Jesus performed signs and wonders among the people, and also how the apostles did this. But this is actually the first time that we read of another performing these signs and wonders. And we talked about this before, but the purpose of these signs and wonders were for this particular point in salvation history. Because it authenticated these early uh, believers, these apostles, as witnesses, as messengers sent from Jesus. Jesus had given the apostles authority um, to to even heal the sick as well. And and the apostles were doing that. And that certainly authenticated them as messengers. It also opened the door for the proclamation of that message. The, the purpose of it wasn't to build a, a healing ministry for the apostles. That was not the purpose. No, they was to, it was to actually to open the door for the proclamation of the, the gospel. And that's what we see in each instance of this. The gospel is being proclaimed. And certainly this was Stephen's goal as well. One who wanted to proclaim the gospel. Of those other seven, there's another man, Philip. And certainly, as I say, the role they were chosen for, while it was one initially of administration, it wasn't just that they stayed in that role. uh, They were also, it was a spiritual role that they were engaged in as well too. And Philip also became an evangelist as well. But Stephen, we're going to see a number of similarities between him and his master. He sought to serve his master. He sought to do his will he was one who was when it says filled with the spirit it means he was controlled his life was controlled empowered by the holy spirit and of course i'm not saying uh, how do we how do we resemble our master i'm not saying our ministry is going to resemble that of stephen's or of, of jesus but it's not that we're expecting to perform signs and wonders no that was for this particular point in the history of the church now of course god can move in any way that he wishes we're not confining what God can do certainly not but these signs were very uh, were important for this particular point in time in the in the churches the early church's history but is it evident to the world that we are like our master can they see in our life evidence of us being full of the holy spirit 
For example, can people see the, the fruit of the Spirit in our life? Do they see that we have a, a love, a joy, a peace? Can they see that self-control in our life? Can they see us manifesting this? Can they see truly that there is something different about us? That we're not just good people, but that we are even showing something of Christ to them and seeking to be like our master. You know, Stephen, you see, didn't just resemble his master and his, his ministry, but he resembled Christ when he, he faced opposition. He was one who sought to proclaim the, the gospel. He was one who sought to do this, as did the early believers. They wanted to proclaim this message. Didn't Jesus tell them to, that disciples were to go make disciples? And that was a commission not just for the twelve. That was a commission for us all. For all who bear the name of disciple. That we are to reach out with this message as well. And clearly Stephen was doing that. It wasn't that he had exactly the same ministry as Jesus. Not at all. But, but certainly he was one who was full of the Spirit. He was one who, well at, at this time he was doing these signs and wonders among the people. And he was seeking to, to live his life. As one who was a faithful witness to Christ. But here's the thing. Stephen bore another resemblance in that he also faced similar opposition. And if we're seeking to live for the Lord. If we're seeking to live counterculturally in a way that, uh, that is countercultural for the world around us. We can't expect opposition. Not everyone is going to like the message of the gospel. The good news of Jesus that we proclaim. And not all welcome what Stephen was doing here because it says there arose some who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen. Now this group was made up, we're told, of Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and some from Cilicia and Asia. And these group were likely called freedmen simply because they were, they were Jews who had been freed from slavery uh, from these various places. And it seems they had come back and, and settled in Jerusalem. <clears throat> but these people didn't like what Stephen had to say. Notice how they responded to Stephen. They responded to him in three ways in this passage. The first is they they argue or they debate with him initially. The first approach is they, verse 9, they dispute with him. That word actually means that they had a formal debate with him. It's actually the same word used um, in the the Gospels when people opposed Jesus' ministry. They sought to debate with Jesus as well. So we'll see what their issue was shortly. But essentially they were concerned that when Stephen proclaimed Jesus as Messiah, they thought, hold on, Stephen is in in saying this, you know, this is going to threaten our whole way of life, our worship, our keeping of the law, to say that Jesus was the Messiah. Though great in in number, they weren't able though to to resist the power and and wisdom of of the spirit by which he was speaking. It reminds us how often the Pharisees sought to entrap Jesus, didn't they? They sought to entrap him maybe when they approached him with different arguments. And their goal was to try and discredit often Jesus in the eyes of the people. Either to discredit him with the people or or else make him unpopular with the Roman government. And so too the people tried these same tactics on Stephen. He resembles his master even in this opposition he faced. Yet Stephen also like resembling his master, spoke with wisdom through the power of the Spirit. This was actually a fulfillment of what Jesus had promised long before. In Luke 21, verse 15, he, told, he said to his disciples this, For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. Jesus had told his disciples they could expect opposition, but he says, I will give you a mouth. You will be able to speak. I'll even give you the wisdom to help you know even what to say. None of your adversaries will be able to to withstand or contradict you. And that's what happened here. This is a very fulfillment of of even Jesus' words. And so so too people will try and engage with God's people to, to try and even dispute with us. Maybe seeking even to somehow discredit or, or misrepresent what we believe. How often maybe have you, you heard a a radio talk show and sometimes when they bring on someone who's a Christian sometimes they they say ah but doesn't the Bible say this or doesn't it say that and they take a verse completely out of context and try and misrepresent actually what we believe we can expect people will will sometimes do that with us who don't believe the gospel who are opposed to the gospel 
but yet how we need the wisdom which God is able to impart with us. The Spirit is able to grant us that wisdom. We need to spend time in the Word, of course, and, and sometimes the Lord can just bring maybe that verse into your mind to enable you to be able to, to speak, to answer that person. You know, can you imagine how it must have been for Stephen's opponents? You know, they were great in number against him, but yet they were getting frustrated. They weren't winning the argument. They thought the verdict was going to be pronounced. They thought strength in numbers, ha, we can argue with them, we'll, we'll talk them down. And yet every time it seems Stephen was able to answer, God was granting him this wisdom. Here was Stephen, you see, he's not relying on his own strength. He's relying on God. And you know, that's what we need to do when we reach out with the gospel. When we have others even challenging us in our faith. We need not to rely on our own wisdom, on our own abilities and talents. We need to rely on the Lord. To maybe, maybe be like Nehemiah, firing up one of those arrow prayers to God. Lord, Lord, help me even before I answer this person. How many times I've prayed for one of those prayers, maybe when I was on the doors and someone has said something. You know, we need to depend on the Lord. But also there's another thing that they try and do. And here too Stephen resembles his, his master. Because look what they do in verse 11. The next tactic they, they play is they try and discredit the messenger. Uh, verse 11 tells us they encouraged others to make an accusation of blasphemy. And the wording implies that they were telling these people what to say. So these witnesses say, we've heard him say blasphemous words against Moses and God. Now, I think it's interesting to note the order of the words there. We'd normally expect them to talk about blasphemous words against God and Moses. But no, they actually say Moses and God. You know, maybe that says something about how important they viewed their, their law to be, their, their ceremonial law, their, their, the thing that many of them were depending on, on outward obedience only rather than true allegiance to God. Some were going through the motions. They were going through all the rituals and going to the temple. They were offering the sacrifices, but actually their hearts were far from God. Again, doesn't it remind us how Jesus was one who also was accused of blasphemy? He faced these very same charges that Stephen did. Mark 14, verses 63 to 64. So they're adopting a, a familiar tactic. They were claiming, they were misrepresenting what he was, he was trying to say. They were seeking to try and silence him. Trying to discredit him. But they do something else. They use the authorities to silence him. We're going to come back to what some of those accusations even were in a little moment. Because the next tactic they use, and this is one that was also used against Jesus. They stir up authorities to silence Stephen. They take him, they take, stir up the people, the elders, the scribes, to the point that Stephen is forcefully taken off the streets and brought in front of the council. Now, since Stephen was a faithful witness of the Lord, he was one who was filled with the Holy Spirit and likely morally they couldn't find a charge against him. And that's something that's important if we're seeking to, to be those faithful witnesses. It's important that we live as we ought to in every area of our life, that people would not be able to level a charge against us. And so they had to resort to false witnesses because they couldn't find anything else to point the finger to. So they raised up these false witnesses. So look at the charges that were brought against Stephen. Firstly, they accuse him of speaking against the temple. Secondly, they say he's speaking against the law. And finally, he's telling people that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy the temple and will change the whole law of Moses. See, what they were doing was they were twisting what Stephen was saying. They were trying to portray him as some kind of revolutionary, seeking to destroy all the existing order. But when you think of it, weren't these the very same charges that had been laid at Jesus? They too were picturing him as a, as a revolutionary, seeking almost to overthrow the, the Roman government. That's how they pictured him. That's how they stirred up the false witnesses to be. Let me read to you Mark 14, verses 57 to 58. These are words not said about Stephen. These are words said about Jesus. Mark 14, verses 57 to 58. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. 
Here, maybe Stephen was quoting these very same words that Jesus had uttered before. Now, to a religious Jew, such talk like this was was scandalous. To speak of destroying a temple. Certainly, Jesus did say something like this, but they had misunderstood the meaning. Turn with me to to John chapter 2. John's Gospel and chapter 2. Let's look at the background to what Jesus said said when he said these words so after jesus had cast out the money changers out of the temple the jews had asked for a sign of jesus authority for him to do this and so in john chapter 2 verse 19 he says this jesus answered them destroy this temple and in three days i will raise it up now the jews we see after this didn't understand verse 20 they said but but it's taken 46 years to build this temple how how can you raise it up in three days well for the answer to this the answer to their question look down to verses 21 to 22 and here john writes himself he says but but he jesus was speaking about the temple of his body that's actually what he was talking about When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This uh, temple he was talking about was the temple of his body. That's what he meant when Jesus said this. The crowds, they didn't understand this. The disciples actually at the time didn't fully understand this. But they did later when Jesus, after three days, was, was raised from the dead. You know, and yet what the, the, the people had did, his opponents, they took these words, they took them out of context, they misunderstood his meaning, and so they used them to falsely accuse him. But they did the very same thing to Stephen, who was seeking to be like his master, who was seeking to proclaim the very same gospel, that truly Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, not a way, but the way, the only way. They proclaimed him that no one could come to the Father but but through him. And as as Stephen was proclaiming that very truth that Jesus was the Messiah. As he shared of these words talking about even of his his death and resurrection. Well they used these words to to trap him. They misquoted. They they, not misquoted. they, They lifted his words out of context. You know maybe Stephen had quoted these very same words. And so like Jesus like his master they sought to trap Stephen. But of course there was some degree of truth in those charges too. Because Stephen knew that both the temple and system of sacrifices were but a shadow of a greater reality to come in Christ. That in giving of himself, Jesus would be the ultimate sacrifice for sin. They no longer needed to make those other sacrifices because Jesus was the final, full and complete sacrifice for sin. The one who would make full and complete atonement for sin. Jesus also taught there would be a day when they wouldn't need to go to the temple to worship in Jerusalem. But rather God was seeking people to worship him in spirit and in truth. This temple was going to be superseded by a new structure. This one wasn't going to be made from from bricks or, or made with hands. But it was going to be as Peter calls a spiritual house. Made up of believers. Made up of believers as living stones. Our offerings are going to be the the giving of ourselves as spiritual sacrifices to God. This was something that, that the apostles knew, the disciples knew. And here they were giving of themselves to their master. Jesus didn't come to destroy the law of their prophets. He came to fulfill it. The temple pointed ultimately to, to him. The sacrifices pointed to his ultimate sacrifice. As Stephen no doubt had explained in his message. But notice, they weren't listening to that part of it. They were listening with a hardened heart. Not receptive to that word of the gospel. And sadly, that's a response. Sometimes when you reach out with the gospel, there will be some who will grasp it. Who will see truly of their state before God and of their need of a saviour. But there will be others who will only hear the bits that they want. His hearts will be hardened and these were what Stephen's opponents were like. Yet what we see is here they try and silence the faithful witness. 
And it reminds us of what Jesus had told his disciples in the upper room. Let me remind you of these words in John 15, verses 18 to 21. Jesus told his disciples, as he was preparing them for, for the fact when they would reach out for the, for the gospel, what they would face, he told them, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it's hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, then they'll also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. You know, if we're seeking to be like our master, we shouldn't be surprised when we face opposition. We shouldn't be surprised when others maybe mock even what we believe. We shouldn't be surprised if we're seeking not to be like the world, but to be like Christ. That there'd even be persecution. This is what Jesus told his disciples the number of times actually that uh, people like Peter and, and Paul, even as they wrote to the early church, had told them, expect these things. Don't be surprised. If you're going to be like Christ, you can expect even to, be, to face some of even the, the trials that Jesus faced, the opposition, the, the mockery. See, if we've trusted in Jesus and our Savior and we're walking in his ways, we're seeking to be like our master. If we want to be like Jesus, then we must be aware of what that means. And we mustn't be surprised if we suffer like our master. Remember what Paul told Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. All who desire to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. You know, we may never face the degree of persecution that Stephen was going to face. But for some believers, they are facing that degree of persecution. There are some believers in, in other countries today whose, whose lives are literally on the line. The situation that Stephen found himself in, they have found themselves in. For us, it may be, it may be just mockery. It, it, it may even be pressure from society as well too but we can expect this if we're seeking to be faithful to our master Stephen found himself in a very serious situation in front of the Jewish council the Sanhedrin and here's the thing you need to know charges of blasphemy were extremely serious the punishment in Jewish law for uttering such things was death so Stephen's life was on the line but how would he respond we're not going to look at the full response of it, obviously, this week. But I want you to look just at the last verse we read tonight, verse 15. Because what we see is Stephen responded firstly with grace. Next week, God willing, we're going to look at all that he said in response to these charges. I didn't want to rush through all of that in one sermon tonight. I thought it was worth spending time on, on how Stephen, Stephen's initial response and how his enemies even attacked as well. But what Luke does, he does tell us how he responded. As they gazed at him, they didn't see in his face panic or alarm. They didn't see terror. Instead, they saw a face of an angel. One amazing response in the face of such great opposition and charges, rather than even anger at these false accusations, was a face of an angel. What does Luke mean by that? Is he, is he just talking about that he appeared innocent certainly he was being unjustly accused but it's clearly more the commentator Daryl Box says it suggests that Stephen has the appearance of of one inspired by and in touch with God reflecting a touch of God's glory what a beautiful way of putting it Stephen has the appearance of one inspired by and in touch with God reflecting a touch of God's glory Stephen reflected God's glory. Maybe it reminds us of how, think of how Moses even had spent that time with God on Mount Sinai. He was one who came down from Sinai and his face shone because he'd, been, he'd spent that time talking with God. And so as this, the, the Sanhedrin look at Stephen, they also can sense there's something different here. 
There's something different here. Do you wonder can people see in our lives something of our lives reflecting a touch of God's glory? Maybe as we've spent time with the Lord, communicating with him in his word and spending that time listening to what he has to say to us and responding in prayer in response to that, can people see that, that difference that that makes in our life? Can people see evidence of Christ in our life? Can they see something of the glory of God reflected in how we live? Maybe even reflected in our attitudes as well. What we're going to see is, God, next week, God willing, as we look at what Stephen says in response, his reaction is one of peace rather than aggression. You know, in many ways, it's kind of the opposite of what we might expect of someone with false charges. If someone was in a courtroom facing false charges, you'd usually expect maybe the person to stand out and say, I, I didn't say it, I didn't say that that way, or they're lying. But he doesn't. He's there with peace. He shows grace. Once more, he reminds us of Christ as master, doesn't he? And how he responds. How are we to respond when when we face even opposition, we're, we're not to fight fire with fire. We are to respond with grace. To have our speech even been almost like seasoned with salt as well. Yet Stephen's doing what we are called to do, reflect God's glory in our life. Let me remind you of some words of, from First Peter. First Peter 2 verses 19 to 23. He says, For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrow, sorrows while in suffering unjustly. For what credit is it when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if you do good and suffer for it, if you do good and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called. Listen to this. This is our calling as believers. For Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. And how did he respond? Well, listen to what Peter says. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, Jesus didn't revile in return. When he suffered, he didn't threaten, but continued entrusting himself to one who judges justly. You know, it's not easy when we, are, we face opposition to the gospel. Often when others mistreat us or speak harshly to us, we might be tempted. Our first reaction might be to, tempt, to, be, to, to be sharp back with them. But yet, in their response, we must resemble Christ our master. When reviled, we must not revile in return. We must commit no sin. We, neither must there be deceit found in our mouth. You know, it's not easy. When we suffer for the gospel... It's an honor to represent our master. Christ left us an example, not that we would fight fire with fire, but the life of Christ and the light of Christ would be seen in our lives. And instead, we do as Jesus did and entrust ourselves to God. What enabled Stephen to respond in such a way? Was it his steely determination? Was it just that he was a calm, chilled out kind of person? No, what we see here is a great demonstration of the peace that passes understanding. The work of the Holy Spirit in his life. A man who was full of the Holy Spirit. A man who was full of faith. A man who believed that what the Savior said when he said that those who believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. One who believed that when the Lord said no one will snatch them out of his hand, he believed it with all his heart. Stephen was a man who had an understanding of God's word, a man who had a good testimony, a man who lived a, as, as, uh, this holy life before God and the world. You know, Kent Hughes draws parallels between Stephen and Christ as well. And he says not only the parallels, but also the different circumstances they faced. But he also talks on the last day of Stephen's life, how he lived. He was one who worked with power, signs and wonders, and as did Christ. He was one who displayed Christ's wisdom because they couldn't withstand the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. But he also shared in Christ's rejection. This group, many of them were likely the very same group who had rejected Jesus. Yet Stephen was faithful. 
Henry T. Mahon once said, when men seek to extinguish the light of the gospel, it often burns all the more brightly. When they seek to extinguish the light of the gospel, it often burns all the more brightly. And isn't that what we see? As this man was stirring in the face of death, it gave him actually an opportunity to proclaim the truth of the gospel. And next week we're going to look at that actual truth of the gospel which he proclaimed. You know, I wonder, do we resemble Christ in our lives? What about our actions? What about our words? What about our attitudes? Whether that be to to suffering in our own life or to others, how do we react? The message that Stephen and the others proclaimed, the gospel of Christ, is the same message we proclaim. You know, and the same power that empowered Stephen, the same boldness that gave him boldness to witness, It's the same Holy Spirit that lives within you and me. It gives us boldness to speak. It gives us wisdom to speak. And so too must we depend on God. And may our prayer tonight was that we would be like Jesus. Can people see the resemblance in our life? Let's close with this hymn which is something of a prayer. It's a prayer that in our lives as we walk with the Lord that we would even have that closer walk with God. Go for a closer walk with God. Let's stand as we sing this together, please. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, may these, the words that we've just sung may be our prayer even tonight, Lord, that we 
we'd have that desire even for a closer walk with you in order that others may see you in our life. Father, as we look at the, the mirror of your word, as that mirror is held up in front of our lives, Lord, help us to consider how we are before you, whether there's anything in our life that we need to put right. Father, we want to be like our master. And Lord, you use your word to, to do that, to, to be part of that shaping process. Use your word and through the Holy Spirit you, you shape and fashion us into Christ's likeness. And so, Lord, do that in our life. Help us to be faithful witnesses. Father, like Stephen sought to be, help us to live for our master, to speak for our master, but also to not be surprised if we suffer for our master. But Lord, help us to hold fast. We do pray for believers around the world at the moment who are living just in the very grips of persecution, who are right in the midst, who maybe whose lives are on the line exactly like Stephen's was. Lord, help them to hold fast. Help them to have that same boldness, but also to have that same wisdom as they speak. Lord, give us that wisdom too as we seek to reach out with this message to others. Lord, be with us even as we move into a new week. Lord, maybe as you give us opportunities to speak for you, help us to speak. And Lord, take us now to our homes in safety. In Jesus' name, amen.